Okay, I think uh, for those who are here, let's get going. The way we have uh, today structured is, is going to be, um, you know, and we're going to do a presentation on the community, community of renewable energy systems. And so I think what we'll, we'll do is, I'm not sure if you're thinking going more than an hour and a half with cut questions and answers at, at the most, but with you folks, you never really know. <laughs> so we'll go with that. You've got a big window in. <laughs> you're really You're dissing us again. And, and you fill three hours. <laughs> well, can you do your presentation in German after Actually, some of the slides are in German. I didn't get a chance to translate them. We'll see how we do. So, uh, well, what we'll do, Michael, uh, the building science guild meets one once a month. It really goes kind of into all issues of building science, and it's it's really an extraordinary group. And so we're glad we're able to come and see how this thing. Thanks a lot for this. As well. um, so my name is Andrew Dye. Um, my last name is spelled D-E-Y, but it's pronounced Dye. And um, I have been working as a construction consultant, primarily doing owner's rep work, owner's representative work on commercial projects for the last few years. Although this last year, um, I had the opportunity to spend in Germany. So I was living in Berlin, Germany with my family. Uh, I've been sort of peripherally involved with the Building Science Group for a couple of years. I've known Guy and some other folks here for quite a while. I thought I'd start with a little bit of um, sort of putting Germany in context. And here's an outline of what I, how this thing is likely to go. So starting off talking sort of in general terms about Germany and Germany's efforts to inc improve energy efficiency and um, implement renewable energy and uh, dial back and actually shut down uh, nuclear power plants now by 2022. So I'm uh, kind of going to start with a pretty broad lens looking at Germany and um, in the context of um, sort of the global context a little bit. <clears throat> and then zero in on a couple of villages that I was able to visit. These aren't necessarily the most well-known quote-unquote bioenergy villages or energy self-sufficient villages in Germany. But these are a couple that are pretty well known and ones that were accessible to me living in Berlin. Um, and they, they've sort of taken different approaches and different processes as they have become energy self-sufficient. So I think it's, for me, it was interesting to look at kind of the different, the different paths that these villages took. Um, and then I want to talk about a, a city called Neustrelitz, which is not far from the village of Wolovic. Um, and that's a city of about 20,000 people. And they've done a lot um, to become energy independent as well, kind of on a different scale from some of these villages. Um, I thought that might be interesting also, sort of to think about places like Keene or Brattleboro. Um, and then just talk a little bit in general terms toward the end about what some of the commonalities are in these different places, kind of the processes that they've gone through. and and think about how, how some of those processes might be relevant to our area here. So this actually didn't, this is supposed to show a map of you know, all the continents. And um, what we've got here is the United States and Germany and just a comparison of the population. So close to four times as many people in the United States and in Germany. Um, this is uh, an overlay of Germany on top of New England. Um, and in terms of, you know, it's substantially bigger than, than the New England states, I guess, in land area, uh, and a lot more people, a lot more densely populated than New England. But just to give a sense of scale, I mean, you can, so, so Berlin is sort of up here, and you can drive from Berlin down to Munich in like seven hours or something, especially with the Autobahns when you can drive 110 miles an hour. Um, so it's sort of, it's, it's, a, it's a country. I was, when I first visited there, I remember thinking how remarkable it was that, um, my then girlfriend at the time, Annette and I could get in the car, you know, in the morning and end up in Austria or Italy by evening. It was pretty, pretty interesting to just be able to, to do that. The population density is pretty, so I never, I never really sunk in before. Well, that's I mean, it's almost four times, or it is probably four or five times the density. Yeah, much more dense. And one doesn't. I didn't feel that living there, and I traveled around the country a bunch, and, and I was mostly, I was say mostly in the northern part, it's sort of like northern Maine, um, but uh, you know, where it's, where it's less densely populated, very agricultural, um, but th the, the population is concentrated in particular centers like the Ruhrgebiet, which is you know, a big industrial and urban area, and kind of 
Frankfurt, Bonn, and, and around Munich. So, um, but yeah, pretty pretty densely populated country. What about the latitude? Is, it, is that that's not meant to be the same latitude, right? I, I no no. I believe that that Berlin is on the same latitude as Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, I looked that up. Uh, so it's considerably farther north than we are. Um, and there's actually an interesting map that I found that I didn't put into this presentation that looks at um, kind of latitude and insulation of the United States versus Germany. And Germany is like closer to Alaska than it is to the continental United States. I mean, it's pretty interesting to look at that and, and to think of what they've done with photovoltaic uh, there, kind of the proliferation and how they've made that work. Um, so just, again, these looking at GDP, um, the countries, well, you can figure out the countries from the, um, the flags, United States, China, Japan, and then Germany. So the fourth largest economy in the world. Um, and GDP per capita, you know, it looks like it's something in, I don't know what, the $40,000 per person, basically, for Germany and the United States is maybe up around 50,000 or something like that. And this didn't come out very well, but energy use per capita, it's about, for some reason, this isn't, the top of this got cut off, but uh, energy use per capita in, in Germany is about half as intense as in the United States. So, so per person, they're using about half as much energy as we are on average. Um, and CO2 emissions per capita, we got some numbers there. Again, it's roughly half in Germany as compared with the United States. So, and, and this is obviously a modern industrial economy and, and you know, you look at something like this and you think there are probably some things we could be doing differently or things we could learn from Germany with regard to, to reducing CO2 emissions. So something that's interesting to me on that one is for all the bad mouthing we do in China, they are less than a third per capita in CO2 emissions. Showing up better. It looks like the U.S. is at 7,000, um, depending on what the units are, oil, KGs, oil, not tons of oil equivalent, but it's, it says here oil, KG, oil kilograms. Um, so the U.S. is at 7,000, and Germany is just shot. It looks like France, Germany, and Ireland, and the U.K. are all, they're all between 3,000 and 4,000. Germany. Um, so we're right there in the middle of Europe, again, kind of putting it in perspective. Um, while I was there, I did get a chance to visit Austria and went down to northern Italy to southern Tyrol to visit a company down there that was doing some interesting things. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of talk when I was when I was there and still obviously about the situation in Ukraine and energy security and what's gonna happen to all that gas that flows through the Ukraine from Russia to, to support the European economy. People are using that as a kind of a, a wake-up call. I mean, there's interesting discussions in Germany happening about, okay, if we were more energy independent, then this wouldn't be such a big deal, right? <clears throat> so this is this is Germany itself, the country. Um, I was living in Berlin. Um, one of the the first village that we'll talk about is Feldheim. It's sort of it's right down here in the state of Brandenburg. There, there are 13 states and then three city-states. One of the city-states is Berlin, one is Bremen, and one is Hamburg. Um, historical city-states, I guess. And then there's the 13 federal states that they kind of had to reconfigure the map, obviously, when they became unified, because I think there had been 23 or something, 23 states, if you looked at East Germany and West Germany. So they kind of consolidated a bunch of states. And um, the city-states independent of the federal states that they're within? Yes, they are. They're treated on an equal footing with the federal states. Um, so they've got their own state governments and state programs, that sort of thing. So I was living here, uh, visited Feldheim, which is south of Berlin. I took a, went down there a couple times, and one time I was able to borrow a car, another time I took a train and then biked the last 10 kilometers. Um, Bolovic is, is over here by these lakes, um, and so is, is uh, Neustrelitz. Um, so up in, this is a, this state here is Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, and there's a bunch of slides that reference Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, um, or MV. Um, my, my wife's parents live right about there, so 
it, it's about a two hour drive to get from Berlin up to her parents house and from there I could visit some of these other places um, and this, this is a it's it's a very rural area pretty flat kind of rolling hills very agricultural and very windy so on the drive from Berlin up to Mecklenburg Vorpommern you start to see more and more windmills wind farms as you're driving north toward the North Sea and the Baltic Sea um, so again, this the, the outlines didn't really come out, but this is this is supposed to be Germany, um, and this is just so showing concentrations of um, of different what are called bioenergy villages or villages that are uh, close to being energy independent or completely energy independent, and you can see, and this is sort of the official the official numbers, and there are lots more that are in process, and I don't know this, I guess dates to 2013. This says that the total number of villages is 100. You can see in 2005, there was sort of one that was recognized. I think it was the village of Yunda, um, which has gotten a lot of press, and it's pretty pretty well known kind of in these energy self-sufficiency circles. 2006 to 2008, there were nine that were recognized. Um, there's, there's like a bioenergy village association that you know sort of coordinates and facilitates and monitors. And um, so it's this organization that's sort of recording this stuff. 2009 to 2011, almost 50, and then the uh, last couple of years, another 40. I went to a conference about bioenergy villages last fall, and, and they were, it seemed like the number was closer to 140 or 150 of villages in Germany that are uh, pretty close to being energy self-sufficient. I'll talk about it, sort of a definition of what it means. Um, so, so this kind of activity, this kind of working toward energy independence is happening, obviously, in the context of the government's programs. And that's probably too small for most of you to read. Um, but basically, the government of Germany has embarked on this very ambitious program to uh, reduce energy use and to trans transition to renewable energy. They call it the Ener Energy Venda, or Energy Transformation, Energy Transition. Um, and there, there are some very ambitious goals. Um, 80 to 95% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions versus 1990 levels. Um, in terms of efficiency, reducing primary energy use by 50% versus 2008, electricity demand by 25%, um, reducing heat in the trans uh, energy use in transportation by 40%. So they're looking to get 5 million electric vehicles on the road. I, I forget what the time frame is, but that's another initiative. Um, in terms of renewable energy, um, greater than 80% of renewable energy supplying the electricity consumption. Um, and a 60% renewable energy share in final energy use. Um, and I came across this quote, some uh, minister in the German government said, kind of, I think it's like characteristically German, this is not a problem, this is a task. Um, <laughs> what's not in here is actually the, um, the phasing out of nuclear energy. So they were on a path already uh, to phase out nuclear energy. I, I forget the time frame. But after the disaster in Fukushima, um, the government kind of re-looked at that program and decided, you know, let's not take as long as we were planning to take. Let's let's shut down all the nuclear reactors by 2022. So that's um, been a little bit controversial, but maybe not as controversial as we Americans might think. Um, I know lots of reasonable people who think that nuclear energy is actually has a role to play in the, in the transition to a low carbon economy. And, um, and I would talk about that with Germans and say, you know, you, you, you're committed to phasing out nuclear power, but actually your carbon emissions in 2013 rose against 2012 because you're burning more coal, maybe because some of these nuclear plants are going offline. And there's, there's different data that can be interpreted different ways about that. But um, so, I, so I figured that they'd kind of embark on this path. You know, they're, they're pretty far along on it and realize, well, actually, we need to keep some of these nukes going in order to achieve our carbon reduction goals. And I say that to Germans, it's like, that's your plan B, right? You're just going to kind of you know, keep these nuclear plants going. They've got a great safety record um, in Germany compared to some other countries. Anyway, the, the, the Germans would say, no, this is, we're serious about this. We don't like nuclear energy. It's like a, a cultural thing, I guess. It's pretty deeply embedded. Um, and it may, it may have its roots largely in Chernobyl. I mean, my wife can remember when she was a kid, and there were sort of these the winds blowing radioactivity across Germany from Russia, and they had to slaughter all this cow. You know, it was just like a real mess. And 
And the Germans are pretty practical people, I found in general, and, and they can't see why you would do something, why you would be creating this radioactive waste where there's not really a good solution for storage. Um, so, <coughs> so they're um, they're pretty committed, pretty committed to uh, phasing out the nuclear, which I think is kind of impressive. Um, I, I don't know if I agree, I, but it's you know if they can pull it off, more power to them. Feel feel free to ask questions. Yeah, as we're going. When were the 2011 goals set, and were they largely met? Um, you know, I'm not sure if that's sort of status quo in 2011. Um, I think, I think that this might be, you know, that, that's such a, such a precise number, 26.4. I think what this is saying is that in 2011, the greenhouse gas emissions measured against 1990 had been reduced by 26.4. I mean, they're making, they're making very good progress, um, particularly on the renewable energy. I mean, you can see some of these other percentages you know, a 6% reduction versus 20% in 2020, they've got a long way to go. But for renewable energy, for example, the share in electricity consumption, they're at 20% 20, 20 in 2011, and it's considerably higher than that now. Um, and they, you know, looking to get to 35. Or the share in the final energy use, 12%, looking to get to 18. I think it's actually <laughs> around 25% or something. I don't have those numbers at, off the top of my head, but it's pretty impressive, the proliferation of renewable energy. Um, in Germany, even just over the last few years. Andrew? Yep. Uh, the last uh, uh, slide in front of the photo of the bioenergy villages, there's quite a concentration down in the southwest portion of, uh, of Germany. Is there a particular reason? Um, I think because it's contagious. Um, I mean, it sort of looks like these little viruses or something that are kind of <laughs> proliferating and replicating. And, and um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that has that has something to do with it, that, that people sort of start to, to get into this and it, and it actually starts to work for them and they actually start to make money and they actually start to get some recognition and other people start taking notice and they kind of become these centers um, that other adjacent areas build on and it's, you know, it's not affecting just the village, it's affecting the region and it kind of builds on itself in a way that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. 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 That's what CIA is going to be. Yeah, exactly. That's what, you know, economic development. We're going to start with Southeast Vermont and drive it to New England and then the country and the world. Um, so these are, these are some, a few charts. There's lots of good information online. Um, but um, one, of the interesting one of the interesting aspects of this energy vend in Germany is that a lot of the renewable power production is owned by citizens. And there are different ways to sort of define that and categorize it. Um, but this is, this is sort of a summary of a lot of the information showing that um, private individuals actually own 35% of the renewable energy production, means of production. According, again, it depends how you slice and dice the numbers. Uh, farmers, 11%. Um, and the, the big four power providers, you know, they're the big utility companies in, um, in Germany, E.ON and RVA and Vattenfall. Um, they're, they're not providing much, and some of them have sort of read the writing on the wall and gotten on board more than others. Some of the, some of the big power companies, utility companies, are, are kind of fighting the government's efforts to promote renewable energy, and, and others are, are saying, I, you know, we better kind of get on the train here because it's leaving without us. Um, This, uh, this, this refers to the generators, okay. um, but the distribution is, uh, is something that is getting a lot of attention in Germany right now. I went to a conference shortly before I came back. It was in June, and it was uh, sponsored by the big utility companies, by the government, by research institutes like the Fraunhofer Institute and stuff. And really, the focus was what are, what are our energy markets of the future going to look like, and how can we create distribution grids that are going to be uh, stable and equitable and sustainable, because um, that's, that's a huge question. They, the, the efforts that they've made to, to implement renewable energy, to kind of get it out there and get it installed, have, been, have gone far beyond anybody's, uh, what anybody expected. So they sort of, they established these prices back in the early 2000s, the feed-in prices where, if, you know, for every, uh, for, for the energy that you're generating, you're going to get guaranteed, you're going to be paid, you're going to get guaranteed access to the grid with that energy, and we're going to guarantee to pay you a certain amount of money. And um, 
and everybody got on board, and now the, the, those charges, those surcharges are showing up on people's electricity bills to actually pay. Um, it's, it's a little bit complicated, but they're paying <coughs> essentially for the success of the energy vendor. And um, so now there's a lot of intermittent renewable energy, and, and how do we integrate with that with the grid and make it more stable? Uh, so they're looking a lot at storage also. Storage is a big topic of conversation. The, the primary forms of, of renewable energy are photovoltaics, uh, wind energy, and this is just looking at onshore, and then bioenergy, which is typically the um, biogas fermentation um, that then fires uh, combined heat and power plants to make electricity and heat. And so, you know, 42% of the bioenergy installations are owned by citizens, the citizen energy. 48% uh, of the photovoltaic and 51% of the onshore wind. So just kind of breaking it up by category of renewable energy. Um, and then this is looking at the installed capacity of citizen energy by ownership group in 2012. So you've got citizens energy associations. There's different ownership formats by which groups can come together and, and um, develop and own energy projects. Um, the the Gesellschaften are associations that um, a particular type of that is called a Genossenschaft, which is a cooperative, and so that would fall under this category. And they're basically started by citizens, and they're owned by citizens, and they benefit citizens. Um, the Bürgerbeteiligungen, that would be um, more investment entities that would be open to the citizens from a local area, but from outside that area too, so they're not necessarily designed just to benefit the citizens in a particular area. And this, the, the Einzel Eigentümer would be individuals. Um, Andrew, yep. so this slide is in gigawatts, but the two slides ago, it looked like the total capacity was 72 megawatts. I'm, I'm confused. Right, so this, this, is, this is 34 gigawatts that's owned by the uh, by the individual. So if you take, I, I believe that if you take the, you know, roughly half of the 72 or the 35 plus the 11, um, oh, that's gives not 72.9. That's 72,900 megawatts. Right. Okay. Right. And but the, and then I think that that donut we were looking at, it just yeah. takes this section here. Got it. Yeah, it's confusing with with the Germans. I guess the Europeans in general, where we use. Um, Decimal points, they use commas, and where we use commas to separate thousands, they use decimal points. So it's just one of those things. And when they draw a number one, it looks like a seven. Um. Yeah. Andrew, I'll hand it to you. So they're, you're rating that stuff in power, actually, of energy, right? Water. And so, you know, that's easy. It's one thing if you've got something that's operating 24 hours a day at a certain set capacity, you know, hydro or something, but I wonder how the I'm just curious how they're getting it to an equivalent metric when they, some of that is solar and some of that's wind, you know? How they're dealing with those numbers. I think they just they, turn it on. They've got to factor in the time, you know? Oh, I, I to make think it this is installed capacity. Like, yeah. if it's, it's just right, installed capacity. It's, it's so, not the output. So it's not directly translatable then right. to energy or different, well, depending on what you're talking about, you'd have to handle it differently to turn it into energy, okay. Yeah. So, so it, I was just struck when I, you know, I went over, I went over to Germany thinking that I was going to be studying building energy efficiency. I was going to be looking at insulation. I was going to be looking at air sealing, ventilation, those sorts of things. Because that's sort of the background that I'm coming from, and sort of where my interest has lain for the last, you know, decade or so. And um, but I, I started to kind of look into these things, and I got more and more interested in these community-owned energy systems because it just seemed really fascinating to me that that so much of this movement was uh, sort of being driven by and driven, being driven by the citizens and, and they were actually owning a lot of it and thereby benefiting a lot from it. And so um, I started kind of shifting the focus of what I was looking at and, and digging into during the course of my stay there uh, to learn more about this um, sort of citizens energy movement. Um, I have a friend who lives in Germany, uh, married to a German, and she said that uh, in all the towns around her, the towns, and this is just what you're talking about, the towns own the energy, um, like, this is wind power mostly that she's talking about, but 
because they own it, they really like it because they can they they have an investment in it personally. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's particularly true with the wind. Um, and, and the wind projects are trickier for the communal ownership just because they're more expensive, the permitting can take a couple of years, There's, they're riskier than just putting up a bunch of TV on the roof. So, but there are, particularly in the north part of the country, Schleswig-Holstein and kind of that, the northern areas, a bunch of good examples of community-owned wind farms. And um, yeah, you're going to get a lot less resistance from the residents of a particular area to putting up uh, wind turbines if they're the owners of them. Um, I mean, it's a pretty clever approach in a way. Um, so I'm so going to take a, a visit to this um, village of Feldheim, which is the one that's a little bit south of Berlin. Um, I first heard about it when I attended this bioenergy village conference in Berlin, and the mayor of Feldheim, a guy named Michael Knappa, gave a presentation about what, he'd, what, what they'd been doing in Feldheim and kind of the surrounding area. And he seemed like a pretty interesting, approachable guy. So I followed up, followed up by email and actually met with him. We chatted for an hour or so. And, um, and then I came back another day and got a big tour with a group of people to kind of check out all the different installations in and around Feldheim. So we'll look at that. Um, at least 50% of the energy needs um, are produced locally by renewable uh, sources. And what, what it means in practice is that typically 100% of the electricity is produced locally, either from PV or from wind. And 50% uh, or more of the heat is produced locally, usually by some kind of a biomass fired district heating system. Um, it's important that the local citizens are involved with making the decisions. Usually they're the ones driving this. Um, and, uh, and also the source, the, the resources, the, the corn silage or the wood or whatever, it's important that that also be owned by the citizens um, in a sustainable, you know, grown and harvested in a sustainable way. Um, it's not to say that other renewable sources like PV and, and wind can't also play a role. They do typically, but generally it sort of starts with biomass, either with wood chip fire, um, combined heat and power plant, or a, um, or a biogas uh, fermentation plant. And um, it's important that people are thinking about efficiency and conservation and, and keeping the what this typically does then is it keeps the value local. All that uh, value creation is kept in the, in the village, in the town, in the region. Um, so, and, and typically the way it works is that, um, let's see, it would, it would start with the land, with the agriculture or with the forest, um, either wood chips um, or, and or um, agricultural waste, typically uh, manure from cows or pigs, and then silage from corn. And that stuff gets fed into a biogas uh, fermentation uh, tank, and that creates gas that then gets fed to a, a combined heat and power plant, a Blockheizkraftwerk, a block heating power plant. Um, so that's making electricity that's typically fed into the grid, um, and, and they, they're getting paid for that, for feeding it into the grid, you know, 16 cents a kilowatt hour or something. Um, and then the heat is going to the buildings in the village, um, typically there, there would be backup or, or maybe this is the primary heat um, and there might be a, a backup uh, oil-fired boiler um, for extreme temperatures or uh, periods of high demand. What a lot of these systems are doing now is they're putting in these big buffer tanks, hot water buffer tanks, so that that actually helps to see them through the, the peak periods, the peak load periods. Um, so that's kind of a schematic of how this typically works in a lot of these villages. Well, compost is, sorry, compost is actually, um, you know, a byproduct of this uh, biogas fermentation process. But um, in terms of composting, like creating biogas from compost, <coughs> there is that happening, landfills. Um, it's a lot of these, these villages were saying, you know, the people that I talk with, when that question would come up, would say, you know, it's just, it's a little too complicated and labor intensive to collect all of the organic waste from the households and try and feed that into our biogas fermentation system. Um, it's less predictable. They have to sort it, clean it, you know, there's, it's just a different kind of a thing. So you can do that, I think, on a commercial scale. I think the cities are more, like Berlin, I think they, everything, all the compost gets separated from all the recyclables and the trash. There's, there's not much left in your regular trash can once you're done sorting everything out in Berlin to sort of the appropriate places. Um, but these villages typically didn't go for that. I mean, the, the villagers might have their own compost piles, but it's not being done as part of the biogas fermentation. 
Yep. How is it being delivered to the house of steam? Generally hot water. Hot water. Yeah. What's the coldest degree they have? They, how are they calculating there? I don't know offhand. I mean, I'm sure that's readily available. Uh -huh. um, is it cold? What, when you were there during the winter, is it equipment around here? Not last winter. Uh, we had a very mild winter in Germany, and I understand it's pretty cold here. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've been going over there a lot, and it seems like the, you know, just anecdotally, it feels like the climate is, um, you know, New Jersey or something, New York. I, I don't know. It's, so they have a big boiler, and they're moving the stuff underground. Yes. Yep. Yeah. You'll, you'll see yep. a bunch of pictures when we get to the village. So. So this is me on my bike uh, heading from the train station over to, to Feldheim. Um, everything's very well marked over there. You can see a sign to the, to the solar park, and we'll take a look at the solar park also. I just thought this was kind of a fun picture. You've got sort of the agricultural aspect out in the middle of nowhere. You've got the photovoltaic panels on some kind of an electrical transformer building or something. Got your little bus stop. Um, and I was headed to Feldheim. Um, and this is also en route, you know, seeing lots of wind turbines in the distance, but it's a very agricultural area. A lot of these buildings dating back probably post-war, you know, 50s built. Um, this is, we're now in what was East Germany. As soon as you get out of, you know, the western side of Berlin, you're in what was East Germany. Um, so this is the entrance, the, the west entrance to the village of Feldheim. There's kind of this, this main road that runs through it. Um, and most of the villages in Germany have these yellow signs that tell you that you're entering the village. And when you see one of those yellow signs and you're driving a car, you need to slow down to 50 kilometers an hour. And sometimes they'll have these, um, they call it getting blitzed, getting flashed. There's these automatic um, columns that take a picture of you. You know, they measure your speed and take a picture of you if you're going too fast. And then you get a bill in the mail a, a week later uh, for speeding. <laughs> Um, I got blitzed a few times when I was borrowing cars or renting on them. On your bike? <laughs> Not on my bike. <laughs> um, but Feldheim has this other sign at, at its entrance also, which is, which is rather unique, um, declaring that Feldheim is an energy uh, self-reliant, energy independent um, location, or, um, and it's part of the, the city or the town of Tleinblitzen, which is a larger town to the north. But this is the little village of Feldheim that is Energie Autaka. Um, you can see the part of the wind farm in the distance. Uh, so energy independent village. This is an aerial view of it. Um, population of 128. Um, and it's mainly a farming village. Uh, there's uh, the main industry in the town, or the main employer in the town for many years has been an agricultural cooperative, uh, Genossenschaft, um, Agra Genossenschaft. And um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but this, this I also saw when I was biking into the village, this old um, windmill that's now defunct, but it was kind of interesting to think that people have been making use of wind in this area for a long time. Um, and this was going on during one of my visits. They were erecting newer, larger, taller uh, wind turbines um, in the wind park. Um, so talk first about the wind aspect, because that's sort of how things got started in Feldheim. Um, there's this guy, um, Michael Rashman, who was a graduate student in the late 90s studying in Berlin. And he actually uh, got it in his head that he wanted to start a wind farm somewhere. And he had an investor. And they were traveling around outside of Berlin looking for the appropriate place that had the right wind, that had the right topography, that had people who were receptive. And they came to Feldheim. And it seemed like it was kind of a sweet spot. There was, there was good wind. Uh, it was a little bit depressed, maybe, that people wouldn't mind bringing in some, some technology, some, um, uh, some investment to the area. And so, uh, and, and this guy, Michael Rashman, was, was quite uh, diplomatic and clever and had kind of the long view. So he sat down with the villagers and he talked with them about what he wanted to do, what their concerns were. And his plan initially back then was to establish a, a wind farm of four wind turbines, so put up four towers. And, he offered the villagers the opportunity to buy into one of those towers, and a bunch of them did. And so, um, so that, obviously, as we were just discussing, it sort of helped to reduce the, uh, the resistance to putting the wind farm in. So four, four towers initially, one of which was owned by the citizens. And it turned out to be a great investment for those people who invested in that initial wind turbine. Um, and 
so there, there was this relationship that started between uh, Michael Roshman, and he actually started a company called Energie Fella, um, and, and the town of Feldheim, and, and the, the wind farm was doing well. And then around 2000, uh, the government changed the incentives to make it much more attractive for the development of renewable energy. This was part of the initial push of the Energie Venda. And so uh, you know, the money that you could make by putting in wind, wind farms increased. It made it more attractive for investors. And uh, Michael Rashman and Energy Kvela, they put together a plan to uh, put up um, 39 more wind turbines to bring a, to a total of 43. And they were going to do it in phases. And again, they kind of involved the whole town with this, got the town on board, and um, built all these turbines. Um, and and it, it's, it's, a very, it's been a very positive relationship between this company and this village. And the company, you know, they, they built a soccer field and put up street lights and did a bunch of stuff for the village. And the village has benefited quite a lot from Energy Fella as well. It's, um, you know, this, this guy, Michael Roshman, is, is not, he, he's a businessman, but he wants to do the right thing also. And, and he's found a good, a nice kind of balance of that in uh, Feldheim. So they're exporting a lot of the power, I assume. Um, most of it, yeah. I think Feldheim uses less than 1% of the power that's produced by the wind farm. Um, so, um, and while I was there on my second visit, um, they were putting up more of these wind turbines. and. And it's not an optical illusion. This, this tower here and this new one here are both along the same road. So you, this, is, this is one of the ones I think that dates back to uh, the mid-90s, um, a 500 kilowatt uh, wind turbine. And the ones they're putting up today are three megawatts, um, a lot taller, a lot larger. This is called repowering, where they're basically decommissioning the smaller ones that are now what, almost 20 years old, and they're replacing them with larger units. Um, and these, you know, I asked what happens to these, because I've, I've heard about businesses that actually are taking these older wind turbines and, you know, putting them up in Africa or other places, but apparently these that were being taken down are going to, they go back to the company, and the company uses them for parts for others of that vintage that are still operational. Uh, but this is a view from the offices of Energy Fella, and you can see some of the PV arrays on trackers as well. <laughs> actually, the... Um, the, the, the largest, the largest units that are being put up these days, I think, are around seven megawatts. I think they're over seven megawatts. The ginormous wind turbines, but but three three megawatts is kind of three point two or something is sort of pretty typical, I think. Um, so so we're into the early two thousands, and and the wind farm is doing great, but the farmers in Feldheim aren't doing so hot because, um, as I mentioned, there's this uh, agrarian cooperative called Fleming that uh, does mo they mostly raise pigs. It's a pig, pig breeding operation. Um, 30 farmers belong to it. They've got 1,700 hectares of land. So you know, that's a hectare is what, a little more than two acres or something. So they're, they're growing stuff on the land. They're raising these pigs. They're using the manure as a uh, fertilizer. But in 2004, um, the energy prices were rising for fertilizer and tractors and the, the prices for the their products were falling, and so the head of the Agra Genossenschaft got together with Michael Rashaman of Energie Fella and said, you know, this has been, you guys have been great with the village, the wind farms, things are working out real well, but the farmers, you know, the, the farmers who are actually have pieces of the lease for the wind farms, they're doing okay because they get paid. They have, um, they lease their land to Energie Fella who put up these wind turbines, but, um, but agriculture is just not doing so great, and so the, the head of the Cooperative sat down with Michael Rashman and, and just to kind of explore what they might do together to sort of um, help each other out in a way. And, and um, people were starting to do biogas fermentation at that time, and it seemed like an interesting way to combine um, Energy Fella's interest in renewable energy and kind of promoting new technologies and the resources that the agricultural cooperative had. And so they decided to go in together on a biogas fermentation plant that would use, uh, you know, be fueled by waste from the pig breeding operation and also um, uh, corn that the, that the farmers would start to grow. So they had been growing potatoes, sugar beets, and it says cereals here, it means grains. Um, so they, they shifted some of the land to cultivating uh, corn uh, for the biogas fermentation. So they put in this plant right on the edge of the village, um, 500 kilowatts, and um, and it was up and running in December 2008. 
and, um, and the output of this, in addition to heat and electricity, there's a, the, the combined heat and power is in this building right here. Um, the, the corn silage goes in here. This tower here is for the grain that gets mixed in. It gets mixed, mixed together here, gets fed into this fermenter, ferments for 55 days. Um, it's, it's like a continuous process, but the, the gas is produced here, and then it runs over to here, and more gas is produced. Um, but the output is this fertilizer that gets spread on the fields. The, uh, the pig breeding operation is over here to the left, and the, the manure goes, liquid manure goes underground, and I think gets fed directly, actually it probably gets fed into there. Anyway, this, they got this thing up and running in 2008, so they're making power and they're making heat. Um, and I don't know at what point the decision was made to do a district heating plant, but these guys, the farmers, the, the agrarian Genossenschaft is now getting paid for the electricity that they're sending into the grid. So they're, they're doing pretty well, but they've got all this heat that's being generated. They thought that they were just going to use it to heat the barns where they're raising the pigs um, and, and whatever other utility buildings were nearby. Um, but it turns out that the output of this thing, for whatever reason, is a lot higher than they had expected. And so they started to explore the idea of using the excess heat from this um, combined heat and power plant to heat the buildings in the village. Um, the villagers were on, were on board with that, and so they ended up building a district heating plant, and I'll talk more about that. Um, so this is a group that I got the tour with in the background, is the pig breeding operation. Uh, people had come from all over the world, from, um, from Cambodia, from Nigeria, from Colombia, South America. And this place, Little Feldheim, of you know, 128 uh, residents, is sort of this magnet now for people from all over the world who want to learn about this stuff. Michael Kanapa, the, the mayor, he's actually the mayor of Toyen Blitzen, the larger town, but it includes Feldheim. He was talking in the Philippines a few weeks before I met with him about sustainable development. So it's pretty interesting to see how these little, little places kind of are making a, a big impression on the world stage. Um, again, here's, here's where the silage gets fed in. Here's where the grain is. It gets all mixed in this building. It's all happening. It's all computer controlled. Um, here's the Blockheitskraftwerk that's um, burning the methane, mostly methane that's coming from the biogas plant. Uh, that engine is turning a generator that's making electricity, and the heat is being captured for the buildings. Um, this is some of the piping and valves and pumps that's distributing the, the water, the hot water. Um, the control system, again, it's all computerized. There's like one guy who checks on it a few times a day. That, that responsibility rotates among the farmers. Um, and there's a company that while we were there, there was actually a company that was doing service. Every three months or so, there's kind of a tune-up or you know, a quarterly annual service on the whole system. And I just I put this in because there's, there's now, I think, over 8,000 biogas fermentation plants installed in Germany. And it's this huge business where you've got companies that are dedicated to planning, implementation, operation, and service of these um, of these installations. It's not, it's not really an industry that exists in this country. I think I've, I, knew, I know of a couple of biogas fermentation plants in Vermont. I was talking with somebody recently who said there are actually eight here. They, the pictures I've seen are a little bit different from the way that it seems to be done mostly in Germany, kind of smaller scale. Some of it's underground, it seems like. But, um, but there's this whole industry that's grown up in Germany in the last 10 or 15 years and makes one wonder, you know, what the potential might be for an area like New England, for, Mont for Vermont and New Hampshire. Did they wind up uh, heating the homes of the villagers? Yeah. And if they did, was there an infrastructure already in place to fight? No. No? No, but we'll get to that. <laughs> infrastructure. <laughs> So uh, most of these we're talking about, they're making gas and then running internal combustion engines from the gas Correct. to run the generators. And so, and what some people are used to is this idea of you know, burning it to make the steam, and then the steam water to turn a turbine, like which is the more common way we would generate electricity here. But they're just they're running internal combustion engines. They're basically running generators, and the generators are fueled off the of biogas. Yep. Yeah, and actually. Um, I don't know if you can see the little GE logo logo here on this, but GE is a big player over there. In fact, the CEO of GEO, GE was speaking at that, the last conference I went to. He's there; they have a, a broad presence in. So, so I'm confused. Europe. You're saying the combined heat and power there is not steam based? No, it's um, oh. this is it's all done with hot water. It's in fact, every, every system I saw was hot water, not steam. 
Yeah, in other words, like you're thinking to cool the waste heat off the generator. So it's just like all the big buildings around here, like the state, like the emergency, all the big emergency backup generators, the propane, fire, they're usually big diesel um, internal combustion engines that have been converted to run on gas and propane. So the same thing could be run on biogas. So you're just running big generators and you're taking the waste heat off the generator to heat hot water and set that up. So yes. So infrastructure-wise, there's you know mo most of the tent most of the houses in the village had little oil boilers. Uh, one guy had a um, geothermal or ground source uh, that he had just put in, so he actually didn't want to tie into this grid because he just spent all this money on his geothermal system. But um, the so so the, the the farmers, I mean, a lot of whom lived in the village, um, the the village got together and decided, you know, let's let's do this district heating grid. We can use the heat from the biogas plant and um, so they so there was an investment that was required to put this grid of pipes underground pipes leading out from the biogas plant and, and leading back to it um, and this is what they ended up supplying um, <coughs> with this system um, and and so there's you're still paying for your heat and for your electricity but ideally it's less than kind of the going rate that other people are paying in general, the sense was that it was about 20% less, um, 10 to 20% less. That seems to be sort of a sweet spot for getting people to kind of get on board with this. The more people you have sign, sign up for it, the more economical it becomes. Um, <clears throat> but that's, so, so there's sort of these, these monthly costs that people are paying, but there's also an initial cost um, that I'll get to. It was bas basically people uh, paid 3,000 euros in order to be connected to the system. It was 1,500 euros to be connected to the heat network, and it was another 1,500 euros to be connected to the electricity network. I haven't talked about the electricity part, but um, it's the main thing. Well, th th this was uh, a big infrastructure project. <laughs> Basically, the town was also, they, they're sort of go, they were going so far down this path of, of supplying their own energy, and they had this big wind park right next door. They, they were wondering, okay, what would it take for us to actually use the electricity from the wind park, and then kind of we'd be totally energy independent. We'd have our heat, we'd have our electricity, and wouldn't that be cool? Um, and so they talked with the local utility who owned the distribution, the electrical distribution infrastructure that was under the, under the ground, because all the electrical distribution in Germany is pretty much under the ground, at least at this level. And my wife still can't believe it when she sees this tangle of wires um, in all our, all our towns. But um, anyway, the, the utility wouldn't allow them to distribute from the wind farm the, their own electricity to the village. Um, and there are certain laws that regulate this, and, and, but basically the town kind of took things in their own hands uh, with the support of Energy Fella, and they said, okay, fine, we're gonna put in our own cables and we're gonna do it ourselves. And, um, the, the mayor of the mayor said, you know, it was kind of ridiculous that we couldn't use the cables that were there. It was just stupid that we had to put in this thing. But Energy Fellow was behind it, and I think they liked the idea of this sort of demonstration project. I think they actually funded it, the 450,000 euros that um, that it took to bury this electrical network, uh, a new one. Yep. Did they use an electric resistance heat at all? Um, you see that used with um, domestic hot water with the tankless water heaters. In fact, in our apartment, we had two of them. Uh, but I don't know if people are using that for space heating. Um, there may be areas where there's just so much electricity. You know, I've heard of that being used like up in Denmark where they've got tons of wind power and electricity and there's so much yeah. resistance heat. But you're showing um, energy units in kilowatt hours per heat. Yeah, just, yeah. Unit. Yeah, they don't use BTUs or anything. Although at seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour for heat, you know that's equivalent to if you were using electricity at the price we pay and running an air source heat pump with a CLP of two or a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's as good a deal. You could use elect electric resistance heat if you could get electricity at that rate. But I mean, they've got the thermal. Heat. You know, technic I don't know the technical details. I don't <laughs> think so. Um, I, um, I just am imagining that all these wires are still connected, but they're, 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 they're actually 
th theoretically. I, I think maybe actually they're using power from the wind park most of the time, but it's less than 1% of what the wind park produces. Um, they, I, I don't know if they actually cut cables when they kind of this came on board or not. Well, the, the cables that go from the wind turbines are running under farmland that's owned by the farmers. And depending on whether you've got a tower or whether you've just got a cable running under your land, you get a certain annual payment. There's lease payments. That they, that's under town land, I believe. That's just running under the roads. Yeah. 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 I mean, they, they said that for a year that the town was a, was a construction site and, and everything was torn up, but then it was all done. And they put in fiber optic at the same time, so they did that heat. They heat pipes, they did the electricity, and they did fiber optic. It's just hard to imagine the, the infrastructure economy at scale for 35, what, what 40, 42 buildings? That, that, that's just bog. Well, it's not, I don't think it's there without um, a deep pocketed partner like Energy Fella or the government support and incentives. And so that's, I'll, I tried to sort of speak to some of that. It's like, how could, how could you do this? It just doesn't make sense. Um, and there are some people who seem to be doing a lot of this without a lot of um, subsidies. And but a, a lot of these projects do rely on subsidies. Um, so, what's the diameter, sort of, at these thirty-five homes or whatever? Well, that's another thing that helps. Every, they they tend to be very compact because it's these you know there's like one street going through. Everybody's on the street, and then there's just farmland all around. Um, so, it was maybe. It was less than a kilometer from one end of the town, you know, like a half a mile from one part of the town to the next, one end to the other. Um, so, so when they put the district heat system in, they they also added a wood chip fired uh, biomass heating plant. Um, I, I don't know if that's because they were concerned. I think they, they maybe needed to boost the capacity of what was coming out of the um, combined heat and power. So they, there was a lot of heat coming out of that, but maybe not enough to do all the buildings in the village, so they added this, and this is coming, you know, the, the wood chips are coming from forest lands that are owned by the agrarian cooperative. So again, it's sort of keeping it all within the village. Um, so does this imply it's only running during very cold weather? Or? Yeah, because you've got the, the biogas is running all the time. Um, and is this also, are they gasifying this wood and running, I'm just trying to question this, uh, this is steam. They're running a boiler. They're running a, I mean, not a hot water boiler, but a steam boiler. You know, I'm not sure. Well, usually, I, people say boiler nowadays. Sure. They're running. They're turning turbines from steam. Yeah, this, this actually, this isn't creating electricity. This is just it's creating heat. Oh, no, just oh, hot water. Right. So it's just heating. Yeah. So yeah. it's just so, a hot water boiler. Yeah. So the, the pipes oh. actually come from the biogas plant over here. They run through here, and then they run to the village, so that hot water from here can be added. And you've got these are. I think buffer tanks here that hold hot water as well. Um, this is just a shot on my bike ride back to the train station showing that, you know, this is the, the kinds of forests that are around there that, you know, look like they're maybe 20 years old or something. They're all planted in rows. It's like a red pine kind of thing, plantation grown, and you've got the fields here as well. Um, so this is a little hard to, to gather, but basically you've got the, you've got the biogas plant here that's creating heat, the verma. And you've got the biomass uh, boiler that's also creating heat. And that's going through the district heating system. And it's providing heat to the agricultural operations, to Energy Fellows Factory. They built a factory in the town of Feldheim and created 23 jobs, and to the houses in Feldheim. Um, the power is coming from the wind park. And it's going, you know, a small portion of that is going to the homeowners. It's going to Energy Fellows Factory, and it's going to the agricultural buildings. Uh, but it's also will be going to a, a Betelich, like a, a battery storage system. So um, that's that's was they were hoping to get the battery storage system online in Feldheim by the end of 2014. The tour guide, the, the woman who was leading our tour when I went back there for the tour, said that the battery storage system was so that. Um, when the wind wasn't blowing, uh, the villagers wouldn't run out of electricity for a few days or something like that. And that sounded a little odd to me that they, you know, somebody would be paying 13 million euros for a, a system that would provide a little backup electricity. It turns out that the government of Germany is very interested in finding ways to modulate the unevenness of all the renewable power. So they're investing heavily, or they're supporting the investment in storage systems. And so Energiequelle 
again, kind of wanting to be on the forefront of a lot of this stuff, is ponying up the $13 million for this battery storage system. And it's actually going to be taking excess power from the grid when it's available, storing it, and then feeding it back into the grid to help modulate spikes and fluctuations in the overall uh, utility grid, the electricity grid in that area. So it's not really about Feldheim. Uh, it's more about Energy Quella and the grid. Um, it's, uh, they make trackers for photovoltaic arrays. So, so again, it's sort of this synergistic relationship between Energy Quella and the town of Feldheim. You know, thanks to Energy Quella's help, uh, power and heat in, in Feldheim are readily available and inexpensive. And, and Energy Quella decided to build a factory when they, when they decided to make uh, trackers for PV arrays. They decided to build a factory right there in Feldheim. So it, and then that becomes an employer for Feldheim. Energy being reimbursed for their investment by the German government? I, they get paid for storing the electricity and then for releasing it, as the way I understand it. I would imagine that there is some support for that, you know, that, they, that they're not out of pocket 13 million euros. But I, I think it's a combination of them putting some investment in, the government putting some investment in, and then they're able to realize some return on that investment when they get paid to store the energy and release it. What happens with all that excess heat in the summer? Good question. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a, that's that comes up a lot, and, and there are not. Um, well, actually, so this factory is using it to cool. They're using it to cool the factory, and we'll see some pictures of that through um, absorption chiller, absorption cooling. Um, and and I visited other places where they're using the excess heat to dry wood chips before they burn them in a boiler. They're using them in dry kilns for, for wood, for lumber. Um, there were people at, at one village I visited that were talking about burying pipes under the asparagus and, and strawberry fields so that they'd heat up the, the soil earlier in the spring and they could kind of get a jump on the, the season. Uh, they use them for grain dryers because a lot of this is in, you know, they have grain silos in agricultural areas. So, but, it, but it is potentially an issue, um, you know, what to do with that excess heat. You have to do something with it. You can't just let it sit there. I, I, you know, I think it can it gets released. I think um, in the summertime, but I'm not. I, or you have to you have to cool it somehow to release it. I, I don't know. Okay. Maybe other people know. Yeah. What, what technology are they using for storage? Is this something new? Is Sorry for storage of the excess electricity. Uh, here? Yeah. Um. Not a bunch of double A's. No, no, it's it's like some you know the kind of stuff Tesla's working on, I think. It's and I don't know if that's lithium ion lithium ion or or what. Um, but it's yeah. yeah, it's something that's the size of a tractor trailer and is there another question? I I thought you said when you started maybe it was something else, that there was an auxiliary non biomass generate uh, I showed a schematic that actually had a backup oil-fired boiler, um, but this this actually has um, where are we? This this has a, apparently this has electric resistance heat backup that has never been used, and I guess they figured with with a lot of electricity available for the really extreme kinds of situations, let's use electric resistance backup heat to heat the water to create space heating. I mean, it's it's but apparently they've never. But it's not unusual for these kinds of biomass heating plants to have some kind of fossil fuel backup. Um, so the, uh, but the cogen plant, you're saying you think has some sort of air cooling dump radiator or something? Yeah, I should have asked about that, and I, I don't know. Um, so just looking a little bit at the structure, there's this, this limited liability company that was created. Um, where uh, Energy Quella sort of takes a lead role. There's 49 residents of Feldheim and Troy and Breitzen. Each, each one of the, they're all equal partners. They all contribute if they want to be connected 3,000 euros. That's 1,500 for heat, 1,500 for electricity. There's a committee of five because it gets a little unwieldy with 49 people that uh, you know, make decisions. Um, and this was, this was something that was kind of interesting that only the, the owners in Feldheim were allowed to become partners of this company. And they were looking to change that so that people who are renting or, or whatever might also be able to take advantage of some of this. Uh, but so this is one, one structure, this sort of limited liability company that um, owns the district heating 
network. Um, so funding, um, these are numbers that I got from a presentation that we were given at Feldheim um, when, when I visited there. Uh, this is for the district heating network. Um, so 1.7 million euros. The limited partnership put up 138,000. I don't know if that's 3,000 times 49, roughly. I think it is. Um, and um, so public subsidies, you can see, uh, was um, nearly half of the cost of this. So that's money coming from the government, money coming from the European Union, money coming from regional development support funds. Um, and the balance of it was done with conventional banking. Typically, um, typically these are local banks, so they're sort of part of the community also that are making up the, the balance of the financing needed. So we've got the investment bank of the state of Brandenburg, um, the European Union funds for regional development, investing in your future, um, and a Hifella, the, the uh, cooperative, or, or rather the, the company that was created, the limited liability company. I asked why they created a, a limited liability company instead of a, a, a cooperative, a Genossenschaft, and they said, I was told that, um, actually by Michael Roshman, who I got to meet, he said that uh, it was simply a matter of timing. They, they needed to like pull this all together in a certain time frame in order to be qualified for the subsidies or whatever, and they just didn't have time to do the cooperatives. This was apparently faster to create the limited liability company. Um, How much is a euro now? Um, one point three eight is what we we were using what we were seeing the, for most of the year between one point three five and one point four. See, so like you go to take five hundred euros out of the bank account, and it would range from six hundred and eighty dollars to you know, seven hundred dollars. What's the uh, cost for a unit of energy not from this? You know, like a utility. Um, I don't know if I can speak to that. I, can, I, I know that the wholesale electricity prices in Germany are some of the lowest in Europe, and the retail prices are some of the highest. Um, the Germans are paying, I think, on average, something like 28 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, um, but the, retail, the wholesale price is down around 3 or 4 cents. Is it, you're converting to American? No, I'm not. So cents is a breakdown of euro? It's a little more than a, than a U.S. cent. Good. But the, the connection costs are pretty, if they're, for 3,000 euros that they can get, get they're, they're set up by into this system, that's like, you know, putting in a heating system in your house for $4,000, right? right. right. Central heat. Yeah, and it comes with a sort of guarantee of service yeah. that's included, you yeah. free up the space, you don't have combustion in your house, I mean, there's all kinds of advantages. That's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it helps, you know, this is what I think helps yeah, a lot. Right. Yeah. And it's probably not a lot of turnover, but if you, you sell your house and you go somewhere else because a new buyer, you know, that must all be worked out in there. The, the, the sort of the, the agreement goes with the house. Yeah, that's probably why it's owner based. Yeah, right. Yeah. The, um, you know, speaking of turnover, one of the things that's happening, and, and you know, these are a lot of depressed rural villages that you know reminded me in some ways of sort of Pioneer Valley, Precision Valley. You know, there was a lot of industry, and now it's gone, and and the, the young people are moving out of these villages because they don't see a future for themselves. But in a place like Feldheim, you know, there's stuff happening. There are things going on. It's like there's there's a kind of a buzz there, and people are sticking around whether it's to work the land as farmers and kind of participate in that way, or whether to work at the factory and kind of be involved with the renewable energy. So. Did it start there with that first wind farm that the guy did? Is that what really That's happened? kind of what, what kick-started it all, yeah. I mean, it was sort of this fortuitous coming together of this guy and this company and this village and, and this, you know, the incentives from the government that kind of helped to jumpstart it. Um, so, so the, the local electricity grid, you know, varying all those cables, um, I was told it cost 450,000 euros. I, I think that Energy Fella just ponied up that money, or, or I suppose the 1,500 euros from each person. So maybe there was, there was some money that, uh, you know, <clears throat> 80,000 euros or something came from the citizens, but, uh, but that was mostly Energy Fella, I think. Um, and I, and I, I don't know why they would have done that except as a, like a prototype project, a goodwill project, or um, demonstration kind of PR. 
um, but it makes a good story. So then we went, there, there's the solar farm. Remember this, the sign when I was biking to the village of the solar farm? It's about, I don't know, eight kilometers away. This is, on, this is um, not owned by uh, Feldheim. It's owned by Energie Quella. But the trackers that all these arrays are standing on are made in that factory. They're produced by the, the folks who live in, in Feldheim, a lot of them. Um, it was built on a, on a Russian military uh, communications kind of grounds, this big, big area. You know, the Russians had all these military installations, particularly around Berlin. And, um, and then they just kind of pulled out in, in the early 90s. And they left all these buildings. They left all this toxic waste, you know, as this brownfield site. The town of Troy and Brietzen didn't know what to do with it. You know, they didn't have the money to kind of fix it up and make it usable again. So in comes Michael Roshman. He's interested in doing a big EV farm. He gets a good price on this area, on this property from the town of Troy and Brietzen. He puts in a million and a half euros to kind of clean it up and take down the buildings. And he puts up this, you know, then he makes another investment and puts up this, this solar farm. Um, and the trackers are made um, in that factory that's in Feldheim. <coughs> you can see here, this is, a, this is a bunker that was part of the, so, the Soviet military infrastructure that was on the property. Um, and this is a group, again, that, that we were visiting with. So it's really become a destination, people coming from all over to, to find out what's going on there. Um, so, so there's that stuff that's happening, and now we're back in the middle of fell time, and, there, and there's been so much energy and attention that um, what they're doing is they're actually starting this thing called the, uh, the New Energy Forum fell time. It's going to be in this building. They kind of, there's a courtyard behind, so this building here is this red one right here. Um, actually, they're, they're, they're renovating the building. They were renovating it when I visited, um, kind of historic facade on the front and putting uh, mineral wool and stucco on the, on the other sides. Um, so, so there's that, that building here, there's going to be exhibitions, there's going to be an academy for training over here, a, a big courtyard in the middle, um, exhibitions I guess here, or presentations, uh, a laboratory and research, and here's where that energy storage battery is going to go, so part of this whole complex. Um, they're going to have this, this one, one, of, one of the wind turbines is being dismantled be, in, in the repowering, they're going to take the, the uh, top of it and put it on display here. So, so there's really, you know, it's become a center of excellence, if you will, or a, a center of focus for some of this re renewable energy stuff, and they're really capitalizing on it um, with the creation of this uh, new energy forum, Feldheim. Uh, they've, they've already got the electric car charging station there. Um, and, okay, so, th so this is inside the, the Energy Fella factory. Uh, where they're, I guess, setting up to put, you know, build mounts for this array. Uh, I got a little tour from Michael Rashman and another fella uh, who works for the company. Um, and there, there wasn't a lot going on in terms of tracker production in the factory when I was there. But what Michael Rashman was excited about was this is a, this is a turbine. This is from the top of an older turbine uh, where you can see the blades attached here, the three blades. And there is a shaft and, and a, a generator, I guess. And, um, this is going to be part of a display that's going in the New Energy Forum Feldheim uh, for people to see. And there's going to be this cover with the glass or the plexiglass kind of so you can see inside what's happening. He's very excited to show that off. That's Herr Rashman. And this, he also was excited about this. This is the absorption cooling system that uh, uses waste heat from the combined heat and power in the summertime to create air conditioning for the, for the factory in the summertime. So a uh, bunch of benefits that, that this town is, is realizing in terms of the agricultural products, diversification and using them commercially, job creation and security, uh, security and energy prices, keeping the value in the region, avoiding uh, heating oil costs, um, business tax re revenues, other companies are drawn to the area, um, people are excited to be actually moving there instead of moving away from there. Um, and, and they're positioning themselves as a center of excellence. They're touting themselves as energy self-reliant, CO2 neutral, direct energy supply. They've won a bunch of awards. And uh, here's, here's the mayor, Herr Rashman, uh, actually Michael Rashman of Energy Fella, Herr Kanapa, uh, the mayor, and some of the some of the awards that they've won. Um, it's been like 
um, hour and a quarter, and I'm only about a third of the way through. So um, we can actually just just one one final note. I, I asked Herr Kanapa what's next. You know, it seems like there's a lot of successes in Feldheim, and where do you go? You've got the battery storage system they're working on, but what he would like to do is is see what could be learned and implemented from the town, from the village of Feldheim to help support the town of Troy and Britzen, this town of five or 6,000 people, which is you know, six kilometers to the north. So he, he was talking about a bunch of different ideas. Maybe there's a bunch, you know, maybe there are Feldheims around uh, Troy and Britzen, so to speak, that are creating excess energy that are feeding it into this town of five or 6,000 people. Uh, maybe some of the abandoned buildings in the historic downtown of Troy and Britzen are gonna be, you know, we'll fix up the facade and we'll use it to, house a, a block uh, heating power plant, you know, a, a CHP, and we'll have kind of micro CHP distributed throughout the town, and that's a way to make use of these abandoned buildings. Um, he was, he's at, he hired somebody full time to kind of work on some of these issues to see how to, how to scale some of what had been learned and implemented in the little <laughs> village to the nearby town. Um, I could keep going. We could take a break. So, so there's, there's sort of there's the village of Bolovic, um, which is fewer slides, and then there's the town of the city of Neustrelitz, the 20,000 people. Um, view of Bolovic, which is to the north. It's about a, a hour and a half drive north of Berlin. You can see biogas stuff going on here, uh, photovoltaic on the big barn in town. Um, um, yes. And, and I'll talk a little bit about this uh, retirement community that's being built here as well. And this is actually kind of on the spread outside for these villages. Sometimes they're really more compact than this. I mean, this is a, this is a bigger village than, what do we say, Feldheim had 138 residents, so this is uh, considerably larger. Three kindergartens, this, um, retirement community, and, and their claim to fame is this huge fieldstone barn, uh, five farms and woodworking shops, and this is a, this is a retail operation that's also um, butchering and kind of organic meat. So they produce, they make uh, sausages and processed meats there and then sell it at this little cafe bistro. Uh, here's the barn. It all started with a barn. But this barn, it was built in the, in the 1880s and it was used agriculturally until 1990. You know, if you recall, that's about when the wall came down, 1980, 1989. And so there were these uh, agricultural cooperatives in East Germany that weren't functioning all that efficiently, but it didn't really matter because they were going to get, you know, there was going to be food on the table, they were going to have a job. Um, but when the wall came down, um, it was sort of, it, it was tough for these kinds of operations to make a go of it because the West German technology and culture and kind of um, attitudes really, work, work ethic, if you will, um, were, were tough for the East Germans to compete with. It, I remember my, my father-in-law, he actually started a, a window and door company in what had been East Germany in the mid-90s. And he said it was really hard to, to train these people who hadn't really had to work very hard. I mean, it just wasn't part of the culture. I have to be careful what I say, but basically <laughs> they, they weren't, if they worked harder, they weren't going to make more money or get ahead because it didn't really matter. So it, it sort of seems like it's taken a generation to kind of change some of those attitudes or ethics. Um, anyway. So there's this big barn that was defunct because um, the, the, the dairy business, the, the dairy operation went out of business and it couldn't compete with others. So what's the town going to do? They've lost these jobs. They've lost this, um, you know, this mainstay of the local economy. Um, and again, it was the mayor who sort of took the lead. He had grown up in a, in a little house right next door to the barn. He sort of <clears throat> watched through good times and bad what had happened with uh, kind of politically and financially with the town. So he decided that they were, you know, he took the initiative in, in fixing up the barn, and um, they, they gutted it, they kind of did structural work, they uh, rebuilt it in a way to, that preserved a lot of the, uh, the history, and they put photovoltaic panels on the roof, and they eventually ended up with a district heating system that's heating the barn. Um, it's a big place, it's not, I mean, it's huge. Um, this is a, a conference room where we met. Um, and that, that's actually the mayor. Um, and, and again, they're hosting people. The, this group was from the western part of Germany, but they're hosting people from all over to teach them about what's going on in this town. Um, 120,000 visitors per year. So again, it's really become a magnet. It's, it's kind of a tourist area. They've been working, that state has been working on building up tourism. 
ever since the wall came down, and now it's seeming to be pay, seeming to be paying off. Um, but there will be buses that you know pick up tourists from Hamburg. They come off the ships. They'll stop in Volodik on the way to Berlin or on the way back. Um, so, so it's an impressive project that they've been able to pull off with fixing up this barn, and it's been kind of a catalyst for a bunch of other stuff that's happened in the village. Um, so the, the biogas fermenters are owned by a couple of farmers. There's a couple of plants and, and others, I think, under construction. So again, the farmers sort of take the initiative and find the funding, but now they, they're producing this gas, and they use it to create electricity and heat, but they can't use all the heat. So it goes into a district heating system. Uh, the town paid for the district heating system. This is a, from the insulated pipe that gets buried underground. Um, and this is the heat exchanger, I think with a buffer tank, the kind of setup that would be in each house that would be making use of the hot water that's coming from the, from the district heat network. Um, this little thing says, uh, this little building says fresh milk, fresh milk on the front of it. And it's true, you can go through the front doors there and you can actually, there's a, a milk dispenser where you can get fresh milk, but from about here back, the, it's access to the back side of the building, it contains uh, buffer tanks, piping, valves, uh, circulators for the district heating system. Um, yeah, so this is like a, a little self-service fresh milk thing. You can bring your bottles and fill them up. And apparently it's been great business for the dairy farmer who's, uh, who keeps it stocked with milk. Um, so this is in the back side of the building, the buffer tanks, piping. Um, so kind of an overview of some of the different things that they've done. They're, they're covering 31% of the heat requirements, I guess, with the district heating system. Um, and they're looking to expand that. They've done a bunch of LED work in the town, uh, put up a bunch of solar on community buildings. Um, and, and what was interesting to me to see at, at all the conferences I went to, it wasn't just about the technology, it wasn't just about um, efficiency, but there, there tended to be this sort of social justice aspect, for lack of a better phrase, to a lot of the discussion that was happening, like the conferences would have, you know, they'd have these different tracks or different components, but there would always be a session on, okay, what does this mean for the poor people? What does this mean for the old people? You know, and, and that's just kind of the way that culture is, the way they think. And so when they're thinking about renewable energy, when they're thinking about economic development, they're thinking about, you know, how can this benefit the people who sort of need more help um, and maybe aren't as readily able to participate. So. Part of the effort in this town is, is actually setting aside a parcel of land, um, dividing it up, and building houses that are geared, high efficiency houses geared toward people that are 55 and older that will be served by the, uh, by the district heating system. Um, so here's, this is kind of the entrance into that area. Um, own home instead of old folks home, living with friends. Uh, the, the clever person thinks ahead, and you? Um, <laughs> So, and you can see these are, these buildings have a lot of them have PV and they're all built to pretty high standards of efficiency. I'll go through these pretty quickly. This is just looking at kind of the different and uh, different entities that are involved in Bolivik. You've got the, you've got the county that, of which Bolivik is a part, uh, the community itself. Um, you've got the farmers who are making the biogas and turning that, you know, producing heat, supplying it to the community. Uh, the community actually administers, you know, put in and administers the district heating plant, so then the heat goes to the private buildings. Um, you've got a company that's servicing the district heating plant. They, they have a lot of experience specialized in that. I think it adds like one cent a kilowatt hour, something to the heat price, I read. Um, and then you've got these consultants, the, these guys, Dorfburn and this ARGE, which is sort of a working group of citizens um, that are sort of advising the community and the farmers who are supplying the heat. So, um, you've got uh, kind of the money sort of doing this, and you've got the, the whole group working together to make this a success. And, and now they're, you know, these, these guys, the consultants, are working with other villages because they've de demonstrated success here. So uh, other, other towns want to do what's happening in Bolvik because it's obviously so successful. There's actually towns that are jealous that, you know, Bolvik's getting so much attention. Um, so these are, these are slides I didn't get a chance to translate, and I'll just run through it quickly. There's, as best I can, there's 54 connections to the net. There's um, two heat, heat uh, savers, uh, I guess buffer tanks, uh, contract, a technical contract, contractor tech 
technical support and sales, um, project management contract. Um, so I guess it's just looking at the contract structure. Uh, what was interesting to me about the slide is that it said um, con contracts make equal partners. It, it can go even without the state, meaning without the government. So, so these are people who aren't, and they're trying not, or they're, they, they don't want to rely on the government handouts. They don't want to rely on the government subsidies. They want to try and you know, bootstrap themselves up and make these things happen uh, with local help. So this, this is the, uh, the, the service company, Stavenhagen, that's, that's um, running the district heat company. It's communally owned. It's in the local region. They've got lots of experience with this stuff, and they're sort of overseeing the district heat operation. Um, so the, the farmers invested 180,000 euros in the combined heat and power connections, I guess. Um, I'm not sure if that's the block heights crop work or, or just connecting to the district heating net. The communal district heating net was 570,000, and the community paid for that. Um, the part of the system also is the um, heat exchangers that go into each each house. So the total investment of the system was 1.2 million euros, um, and I guess they're giving a kilowatt price per connection of a thousand euros, which looks pretty high. And, and the point down here is that it's 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 lower cost to go with an oil boiler, a gas boiler, uh, in an old building. Uh, it's more expensive, this is again per kilowatt, so it, you can see it's more expensive here, 1,076, which is why therefore the government is, and, and the state are supporting the implementation of these kinds of things in the old building stock. Uh, because it's not, it's not cost competitive to do it if you're looking at some of the fossil fuel alternatives, so the government's supporting that. This is, this is taking the warm water from the, I think it's, it's separate loops. It's, it's taking the, the hot water from the district heating system and it's transferring it to the house to be used as domestic heat and, and domestic hot water. Where's that third? It's a water pump, I believe. This is just looking at, uh, you know, again, the, the, this is saying um, adding value through competitive um, bidding. So they kind of put it out to competitive bid to local guys and, and work with them to get the best pricing. And they ended up working with three different excavators and different local people to make this happen. Uh, it was 100% within the state, the people who did this, um, and actually mostly from that immediate region. And they're looking at the climate protection here. Um, 623 tons per year of CO2 eliminated through the bio heat. Um, 3.8 kilometers, 54 connections, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so this, so the connections, the, the construction cost for the users for a typical 15 to 20 kilowatt system, which is a typical size for those houses, would be 4,500 euros, but with the support of the Federal Investment Bank that's designed to support projects like this, they provide 1.8 or 1,800. Um, there's another, uh, there's another funds available for renewing villages that provide another 1,200. So actually what the owners ended up paying was about 1,500 euros for the connections to this heating system some information about the, the annual price and the monthly price, I guess, or the price. Any sense of where the state subsidies come from, state and federal? Taxes are very high in Germany. Um, and I think a lot of it comes from the tax. I mean, they, they've decided how they're going to apportion the money that comes into the government, and a lot of it goes to this kind of stuff, as far as I can tell. And some of it is European, too, European funds, which come, obviously, from the when you have the fourth largest economy in the world, and there's 81 million people, and you collect a lot of tax dollars, boy, there's a lot of things you can do. Do they have a carbon tax? No, I think so. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a system for carbon trading, I think, in Europe that's basically broken because the price is so low. And they've, it's my understanding, and again, others of you may know more, but I think they're working on rejiggering that so that it makes more sense.
Um, so, so kind of to expand on this concept from this village, they want to do a district heating network in a neighboring village. Um, they're going to add more buildings to the existing heating network. They, have, they like the idea of sort of making the, what's happening there more visible. Um, how, how to use the excess heat, that question's come up, finding some innovative ways to do that. Um, <clears throat> looking at other sources of energy. Looking at smart grids, um, you know, is that, would that make sense to help with the energy management in Bolivik? People are, you know, the, 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 the villages that have made a lot of progress with this are now looking at e-mobility. They're looking at electric cars, electric bikes, you know, because that sort of seems like a logical next step. Um, and I don't know what the, what the ISO 50001 standard is, but I think it has to do with energy management in companies and organizations and can some of those standards be applied to our village in terms of setting some goals and policies that will help us take the next steps. So that's the two villages. Then there's a city, and there's um, you know maybe some discussion about how how these how these processes work. I've also just realized I've got pictures of this fun project that Bill Purdy, Dave Carter, and I have worked on. It's basically Dave and Bill's project. But if we want to kind of change the change the uh, subject here <clears throat> a little bit, we could look at those pictures, and we could call Bill up here, and he could explain what, what's going on. Um, okay. So Neustrelitz, it's, it's near Bolivik. It's, it's in this sort of lakes region of uh, northern Germany. Uh, this town's been around for a little while. Um, 21,000 residents, lots of tourists and visitors, um, lots of parks in the area. Um, <clears throat> and they've also won some awards for some of what they've done. Um, what's, one of the things that's interesting about Neustrelitz, and these are, these are slides that I kind of took and translated from another presentation. Um, so there's a few of these thrown in here. It's just easier than making them all up, you know, making them over again. But um, so mecklenburg vorpommern is the state, um, you know, one of those 16 states. Lea is a, sort of a nonprofit organization that's run by the Neustrelitz Stadtwerke. The Stadtwerke is the, um, is the public utilities or it's the um, it's the public works department basically so so the towns cities they all have their own Stadtwerke um, the city works um, and actually the big con conference I went to at, at the end of uh, my stay in Germany was was geared towards Stadtwerke and because a lot of them are operating local nets I guess but they, they kind of you know in Walpole I know there's uh, Mark Houghton takes care of our water and oversees the water system and but in in a lot of these towns uh, the Stadtwerke are, are handling water, uh, power, gas, and um, district heating. So they sort of, and even in even in Berlin, back in <clears throat> I think it was November, there was a citizens vote about whether the Stadtwerk of Berlin should should have the opportunity to buy back the uh, the electricity grid uh, for the city, and um, and I think even the heating. There's a lot of um, district heating networks in Berlin itself. And that, that initiative narrowly failed. But it, in other towns and cities, the Stadtwerke have actually taken over all this stuff and operate it. Uh, and that's the case in Neustrelitz. Um, so they're covering 100% of their electricity needs now, 40% uh, of the building heating requirements. And, and where the district heat network goes, it's, it's over 70%. So they're really pushing on this whole theme of renewable energy. They've had a lot of success and, again, received a lot of recognition for their efforts. Um, sorry, this is. This, it's all in German anyway. But basically, this is a piece of a kind of a strategic plan where these different working groups focus on different things like tourism, quality of life, um, and, and renewable energy was identified as a theme for this for one working group to pursue. And it kind of reminded me a little bit of what's happening in this area with green products and services being identified as a theme for a working group to pursue as, a, the, as for its potential for economic development. Um, so they focused on renewable energy, came up with a document that was accepted by the kind of powers that be with the goals you know, of long-term security for energy in, in terms of pricing and availability, optimizing the energy supply, um, developing things regionally, and supporting economic development, research, and education. Um, <coughs> So the, the Stadtwerke, they've, um, they're trying to implement best practices in a bunch of different areas. They've got um, natural gas tanking stations for vehicles. They've got a biomass heating plant, uh, combined heat and power plant. 
They've got a biogas fermentation, um, done some pilot projects with PV, and, and they put in a big photovoltaic array outside of the town. Um, so the, the big, this was much larger than any, than any others that I visited. Uh, pretty impressive plant. Um, came online in 2006, uh, providing a lot of power and heat for this town using local wood chips. Um, funded, the total investment was 17.6 million euros. A lot of that came from European funds. Some came from the state of mecklenburg vorpommern um, and the Stadtwerker really took the initiative on this to basically to help protect their clients, this, the citizens of the city uh, that they were serving, um, protecting them against rising energy costs um, and, and the insecurity associated with importing okay. fossil fuels. So they're getting wood chips locally, 15 trucks a day. I mean, it's kind of interesting to think about the North Springfield um, biomass he, that was, uh, I don't know a lot about it, but I know that that was rejected. Their, their certificate of public good, I guess, was rejected, and that project isn't going forward. Um, so economic development, 100 jobs, more or less, with all of the kind of the ripple effect through the, through the area, involving 10 companies to supply this stuff, uh, forestry companies, delivery companies. Um, and, and as happens in other areas, it, it, it makes it an attractive place for other businesses to relocate because of energy costs, the predictability of it, the kind of the innovation energy that's happening. Um, and they're, they're generating a reputation for this town of Nice Trailets. Um, so here's a biogas installation that's owned by the, by the Stadtwerke. Um, this, this is a big tub. This, is, this isn't as sophisticated as the one in Feldheim in some ways. They just they use loaders to dump this stuff in and it kind of mixes it up. And I was asking a guy at one operation, you know, how do they get the proportions right of the, you know, the liquid manure and the silage and stuff? And he said, you want it to be like applesauce, was his technical <laughs> definition for how he knows that it's ready to go. Um, and, and this is the, uh, the Blockheitskraftwerk that's making the electricity and the power using the gas from the fermenter. Um, here's a big solar farm. This was a, I, found this photo online and it, and it was from a press release of, about evergreen solar panels saying that they use mostly evergreen solar panels for this, well, which I thought was interesting. Um, interesting okay. Those trackers that are made in Feldheim are interesting. They're just, they're very, they're kind of simpler and lower cost than ones that try and sense how the sun is shining or whatever and follow it. They basically, every, every 30 seconds, they shift a little bit regardless of what's happening, you know, and you can predict the optimum position of the, you know, of the array for any time of the day, and it just sets, it just moves it very slowly throughout the whole day, regardless. Of, single axis? Or they, they make both. They make single axis and double axis. And they're just run with, they're just driven by an electric motor? Yeah, and apparently these use less energy than other kinds of trackers that are trying to do more, that are trying to be more sophisticated. Some don't use any, some like the ones at the Putney School aren't using any electricity, right? I don't know. That, that, uh, Mm -hmm. So they've yeah so they've got their biomass they've got their solar park um, the uh, I just I threw in a few more slides just to show that it's not all about renewable energy they're doing uh, the energetische Sanierung is basically deep energy retrofit so they've they've done deep energy retrofits to all the schools all of the town owned schools in Nice Trailets have been uh, energetically uh, renovated. Deep energy retrofitted, um, and and again, you, you look at the housing. There's a lot of public housing projects, and these mo most of the towns have some big building where uh, it's affordable housing, and a lot of that is <coughs> by the town. It says that the the, the biggest landlord in Neustrelitz is the um, the, the Stadtwerke, the Wohnungsgesellschaft, which is a which is an apartment uh, cooperative, um, and it, but it's a hundred percent town city undertaking company. And they're doing all kinds of stuff for old folks and affordable housing as well that's sort of all under the umbrella of this development. And then you've got um, private, private individuals who are kind of on board with this also and participating in this movement. So it's not just the Stadtwerke, it's the individuals and companies as well. Uh, heat pump for the, for the swimming pool and <coughs> TV on different buildings. Um, 
So the, the most interesting thing for me in Australia and where I spent the most time was actually this uh, Center for Renewable Energy. And again, where there's discussion of this area about becoming a center of excellence for green building products and services. And um, each one of these towns that we've looked at, Feldheim has the new energy forum, Feldheim that they're building. Bolovic has the barn where they have exhibitions and bring people in and do teaching and training. And, and this is kind of on an even grander, more impressive scale. Uh, a center for excellence in renewable energy that brings together uh, companies and individuals and groups uh, from, from all over. Um, so they're really trying to promote themselves um, as, a, as a center of excellence. Um, and they're also trying to, to act as a coordinator, a facilitator for all the different initiatives that are happening in that area, all the different villages, and so that people can learn from each other and kind of create the synergies that'll further, um, that, that'll help uh, build the momentum. So this is what the building looked like when I visited. Um, and um, so there's uh, platforms for, for windmills that I don't, I don't know if they're up there yet. Uh, yeah, I guess there's a vertical axis windmill there. Um, and photovoltaics on the roof, and there's photovoltaics here on the slope. Uh, so conference rooms and um, company presentations, we'll look at that, sort of booths for companies. Uh, experience world on the first floor for uh, kind of hands-on sorts of things, main entrance, restaurant, exterior area, the energy lab, which is geared toward school kids primarily, and the training center over here. Uh, just a shot on the inside, there's sort of this uh, experience, experience world down here with different exhibits, and the companies are up here with their displays and other presentations and stuff happening. This is the guy that, who, this is the director who toured me around. <coughs> Sort of a few different aspects to the to the mission, and I'm, LEEA is the Landa Centrum Ernoia Energie for for Mecklenburg Vorpommern, and I just I'm using that as an abbreviation. Um, different aspects to the mission, and I'll kind of go through three or four slides here, touching on each one of them. So there's kind of fun stuff to do that relates to to energy um, here. You, you know, this is a kind of cross sections of a wind turbine blade outside. You can see the. Uh, biomass heating plant in the distance. This was uh, where people get on these exercise bikes and they're driving, they're, they're powering race cars. So each bike is attached to a race car and you can race the cars around and the, the results get projected on the wall here. So that's kind of interesting, fun, fun way to engage kids. There's lots of stuff like that. This is just a, um, a screen that's talking about the power production on the roof. There are a bunch of screens like this that we're talking about different aspects of the building and and what it was doing. Um, so, you know, how much energy is being produced, that kind of thing uh, from the photovoltaic. This building produces eco power. Um, so, kind of bringing together the public and the private, the companies, there's a display space on the second floor where companies have booths set up with all kinds of uh, equipment and supplies and materials and expertise related to renewable energy and energy efficiency. <clears throat> um, and it's a place where you know, private people, uh, citizens can come and check out what's available in the area, uh, kind of compare different, uh, different companies and, and learn more about what they do. So it's also a place where a lot of education and training is happening. Um, and this was a, they sort of, they call it the laboratory uh, that's, again, mainly geared toward kids with these different um, spaces and tools and materials for building stuff. One of the projects they would do, they would have the kids do is build these little windmills. You can't really see, but they, you know, try different lengths blades and different numbers of blades. They have like these erector sets and they're building little windmills and then, um, you know, using a, a hair drying fan, blowing on the windmill and seeing how many of the lights on this little representation of the city, your windmill is lighting up, you know, from the, from the fan. So the, the more efficient blade design is going to light up more of the lights on here. Fun stuff like that for the for the kids or for anybody. Um, so they have to take and the results. Yeah, I was just gonna say, how is that being funded? So you've got the sh uh, just trying to explain the Shadrach and Neustrelitz Dan is this is the public works department basically, and they put in about one and a half million euros to LEEA, this Landa Centrum, the, the Center for Renewable Energy. And the state of Mecklenburg Vorpommern put in 1.6 million euros also. So, so about 3 million euros to get this thing going. Um, then the, the Schadwerke has, uh, is supporting, has a contract 
with this operating association, which basically operates the Landa Centrum, the, the center, and it, it acts as a, um, you know, it, it rents out space to the different companies, it, it organizes trainings and exhibitions and things like that. And then there's sort of a nonprofit membership organization that people can belong to that also provides support to this, you know, you buy a membership or whatever and you're helping to support this organization. And so there's individual members, citizens, who become part of this that then supports that, which is running this thing. So uh, the guy who was showing me around, the director, he said that it's not, the, the, the vision is for it to become self-sustaining and, and kind of pay its own way. It's not quite there yet, but he anticipated that in another couple of years they would be able to, um, to kind of break even or, or pay their own way. Um, a, a lot of the projects that we've seen here, they actually pay their own way in terms of you can, as soon as it's up and running, you're making more than it costs you to, you know, for interest in principle, so you're actually ahead. And, and the big challenge is where to get that initial upfront investment money, which is where the, the KFW bank comes in. They, they, they're pretty much involved with all these projects. I, I would imagine that this coming from the state was a grant, um, and this money might have been borrowed by the Stadtwerke and needs to be paid back, I don't know. But there is, there is a lot of this kind of money available to do these kinds of things in Germany uh, as grants. You know, you saw in some of the other projects big, big chunks of money going towards some of these. This was kind of interesting. They're sort of, they're getting together with uh, a bunch of different public works departments in other surrounding towns and villages to talk about, you know, what are we doing? How can we work together? What can we learn from each other? What's working for you? And, you know, and I, I, I think that's kind of interesting. And I don't know how much that sort of cooperative spirit grows out of sort of remnants of the East German communist cooperative culture or not. You know, I think there were some not so good things about that, but maybe some good things about that too. I was telling somebody a little while ago that there's a, a fellow, Tim Maker, who's been trying to get district heating systems going in New England for quite a while. And he, um, he feels that one of the challenges, one of the reasons it's so hard is because Americans tend to be more independent and you know, they, they're not as inclined maybe to work together and share resources for the common good. And, and maybe that's more of something that's sort of built into the cultural DNA, particularly in what was East Germany, uh, where they had you know, the 40 years of working together cooperatively. Yeah? Or, <clears throat> I've been wanting to ask this, just have fun. Is, is more of this happening in Eastern Germany, former Eastern German part of Germany than the West? It's an interesting question, but I think if you go back and look at that map with all the little dots on it, most of those, like there's, there's a higher concentration in what was West Germany. But it's, it's pretty evenly spread. So um, it's, it's not that explicitly, it's the whole culture's doing it. Yeah. It's not just but I think if you spend time over there and in the other European countries too, there's definitely a social, sure. there's a much stronger sense of doing, of working together as a community and sort of uh, more subordinating individual interests to the group interests. Yeah, and I mean, you just look at the tax structure and it's, you know, the, there's no, not big tax revolts over there and they're paying, you know, way higher taxes. But if, with district heating, there's a huge part of what's just I mean, I think a lot of that agricultural area, those low rolling hills, I don't think there's much ledge near the surface or anything. They can just dig those trenches yeah. really cheaply. <laughs> and everybody's much closer together, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just totally different to try to do that stuff around here, except certain places where we know, like, well, you know, you've got a lot of buildings close together. But. Yeah, it's a big challenge, I think. Um, so they're, yeah, they're looking at smart grids also, microgrids, a lot of people. This is just, again, this is, this is kind of hard to read, but I thought this was interesting when it came out of one of these presentations that, uh, about Neustrelitz. But it's saying today there's, there's a few big suppliers that are serving many consumers. So you've got your big utility or your power plants basically here, a little bit of renewable on the side, and it's serving these consumers here. Um, 2015, they're projecting that you know some of these big suppliers are going green with more renewable. Uh, you're going to have more renewable energy supplies kind of on the periphery, and some of these um, you know some of these consumers are going to be pr producing their own electricity. And, and what we're heading toward is you know there's, there's sort of the three big power plants here now instead of the four. So so fewer large power plants, more um, renewable energy installations here, kind of utility scale renewable energy 
installations and more consumers that are making their own energy um, as well. And, and what you can't see is a sort of all, all these arrows going up, tying this all together in a smart grid and in an, an intelligent energy net that helps to monitor and manage and optimize all of that energy usage and energy flow. Um, you know, some of this could be the, the micro, mini and micro um, combined heat and power plants. I saw a lot of those um, at, the, at the trade shows where they're, they're small units that are designed to go in a basement and, um, and they're creating heat and power for uh, one building, you know, even, even a house. It's not that cost effective yet, but uh, in certain situations it can be. It's, um, it's typically their gas. It's a gas engine that's creating electricity and heat um, and for, the, for the house. And it's, it's pretty cost, well, I guess when, you're, when your electricity is 30 cents a kilowatt hour, it can be cost effective. The problem, the heat, and they, they have a much shorter winter than we do. The heating season is quite a bit shorter. So you know, the, the heat aspect of that combined heat power gets back to that question, Chris, of what do you do with all that heat during the two-thirds or three-quarters of the year where you don't need any heat. Now they can make hot, domestic hot water with it and, and use that year-round. But, but if there's more than that, what do you do with the rest of it? If somebody's going to invent an like, all-in-one appliance that's going to also do cooling, it's going to take that excess heat and it's going to create cooling and they'll have air conditioning. Yeah, Although the Germans aren't into air conditioning. But, um, okay, so that, that's it for the fun Pretty stuff good. and the pictures. And then I just threw in a few slides about um, just there's, there's a lot to say about all this stuff, a lot more to say, um, but in terms of the development of some, you know, the villages in particular, there's certain common processes or that, that they seem to go through, the successful ones. Um, and and the, a, a group that oversees these guys and helps coordinate and facilitate and support them, they're broken down into five different steps um, for how, to, how, to, how these villages are making this happen. Um, so you sort of initiate it, and it could be a few individuals, it could be the mayor, it could be a company in the town that's worried about energy costs or something, but there's, there's usually a few what they call subfera, um, like draft horses, like individuals who are championing it and pulling it forward and making things happen, you know, and they're the ones who help to bring everybody else along. And, and they find out if there's much interest, because if there's not, you know, not much interest, then it's really hard to get things moving and, and build a critical mass. I uh, need to be clear what, why you're trying to do this. Is this to save the environment? You know, for a lot of these people, it was really about predictable energy prices. You know, the, the environmental benefits were great, but really the primary motivation was the, the long-term security. Um, and, and you're building a foundation of trust, like Michael Rochman did of Energy Fella. You're, you know, you're demonstrating that you're trying to keep the, the residents' uh, best interests in mind. Uh, and then there's a bunch of groundwork. You're creating cooperatives or nonprofits or whatever. Um, researching different options in terms of the technologies that are available and, and also looking into financing. Uh, and then there's kind of the really getting into it and, and getting down to the detailed level, um, figuring out the cost, getting the financing, and, and actually building this thing, building whatever it is, a district heating network, a, a biomass heating plant, a biogas facility. Um, and then you, you want to make sure you're, you're using it well and people know what they're doing. Um, and, and then there's the whole possibility, as we've seen from these different communities, of really kind of making a broader impact outside and kind of exporting that um, knowledge to other areas and, and having people come in and, and have that support the local economy as well. Um, so that's sort of the question to lead the group with. Um, you know, what, did, what does any of that have to do with us here in this region? Um, Already people have raised some interesting <coughs> points and good points, I think, about some of the challenges that we might face here that others aren't facing. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's certainly worth discussing what, what of this is applicable to our own situation. So thanks for sticking with me for all that. And um, that's it. Thank you.